Okay. Um, we've heard about um, this morning from uh, uh, Dr. Shanghu and, and from Dr. Lee uh, about uh, the Arctic and the way it's warming up faster than other parts of the world. So what I want to talk about here is uh, feedbacks in the ocean system and specifically <clears throat> related to the Arctic and why these feedbacks tend to lead to more rapid warming. They always uh, tend to be positive feedbacks. They lead to more rapid warming than is covered sometimes by models and therefore uh, we must have regard to these feedback effects and take account of them uh, in, in considering how rapidly change is going to be affecting us. Uh, so, well, <laughs> it looks like I'm starting off by advertising my book, but uh, that's because it's gone, I've gone backwards. Anyway, this is all in a book called Adio Aigiaccio, uh, which is called, which is actually a book called Farewell to Ice, which has been translated into Italian. Um, right, well, the Arctic um, always used to be considered to be an ocean which really wasn't an ocean. It was really a solid mass uh, joining Europe, Eurasia, and North America. So on the right, we have, the, the, this is the way the Arctic was in the 1970s, and you always had a com complete coverage of the Arctic Ocean and seas around it during the winter. And even in the summer on the left, uh, the Arctic Ocean would be largely ice covered with only perhaps narrow channels uh, separating it from the continents on either side. So the human race got used to thinking about the northern hemisphere as the land hemisphere with the Arctic being just another piece of ice separating the two great continents of the northern hemisphere. But then, um, because of the, the fact that the Arctic's warming faster than other parts of the world, uh, the, uh, the ice started to retreat and we started to get these landmark years in which the, the ice lay much further back than uh, it had been uh, in, in the past. And 2005 was the first big retreat. But in 2007, we started for the first time to get half an ocean that was ice free. And the, the last year of very large retreat was 2012, where again we have more than half the Arctic Ocean ice free. Now we, we, we can tell that the Arctic is warming faster just if we look at a few indicators. Like at the top here, um, this is the Man Bradley curve of temperatures over the last thousand years, which shows this huge. Uh, uptick on the right, which is due to the Industrial Revolution. If we expand that and look at the last hundred years, we find the climate warmed very rapidly and then hung back for about 20 years in 1940 to 1960, uh, because probably because of burning a lot of lignite, which produced the smoke. So, but that's the pattern was a, a rapid growth in temperature followed by a, 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 a lull and then another rapid growth. Now you can see that the amplitude of that growth from 1900 to now was uh, uh, 0 0.8 degrees. But when we look at the Arctic, if we look at all the stations north of 60 degrees, we find exactly the same pattern. The Arctic has mimicked the rest of the world, but the amplitude is much greater. It's more like three degrees. So there's a, a factor of about four difference between Arctic warming and warming of the rest of the the planet. So this has, has very serious consequences. Uh, it's the first, because it makes the Arctic the first part of the planet to really see, to show us the future in a way, the future that we're going to have to face in the rest of the world. Uh, now the ice retreat uh, was initially, people didn't realize that, of course, if ice is going to retreat and vanish, it's got to melt. And if it's got to melt, it's got to get thinner first. Uh, so measurements um, then started to get done from submarines to measure how thick the ice was. And then this was the first, um, whoop, um, the first uh, paper, I think, on thinning of ice was this one that I published in 1990, which was due, enabled by doing submarine voyages on uh, several year intervals, uh, in this case, 11 year intervals, and the whole region between Greenland and the North Pole 
uh, changed in its average thickness from six and seven meters in 1976 to four and five meters in 87 and in two and three meters in 2004. So uh, we, we saw a massive decrease in thickness corresponding to a, a retreat in area. So you multiply the two together and we're left with a volume of ice in the summer which is only a quarter of what it was in the 1970s. So we, we're down to l having lost three quarters of the summer ice. Uh, so this has consequences like uh, it's very dangerous now to, to go around on ice in the winter. The, the Inuit have been, uh, hunters have been falling through the ice uh, because of uh, it's, it's thinner than it looks. The, the old kind, the ice that we used to be able to work with called multi-year ice no longer exists. That's uh, this very heavy old ice which has been around for, for decades. Instead, we have this kind of ice, which is first-year ice, very thin, uh, and grows a metre and a half in a year and then melts again. So this change in the Arctic turns out to have consequences for the entire planetary system. So I'm going to run through some of them. Uh, one is, first, the albedo feedback effect, that you're replacing a white surface by a dark surface, which is open water, and that uh, reduces the global average albedo significantly to the point where it, it's, it, it's equivalent to a change in the radiative flux due to CO2 being added. Uh, there's an accelerating melt from the Greenland ice sheet, which leads to a, an enhanced rate of sea level rise. There's a possible threat of a methane pulse from the Arctic offshore. There's an extreme weather impact, which is something we're encountering at the moment, uh, again associated with the warming and ice disappearance from the Arctic. And then there's an effect on the an Atlantic thermohaline circulation. So first of all, the feedback um, is uh, associated with, with the, the fact that we're replacing um, a white surface, which used to occupy the whole of the, the Arctic Ocean in summer, by uh, a partly open water. And the reduction of the albedo there from about 80% to less than 10% gives you uh, a change in overall radiative forcing, which was calculated by uh, these authors in 2014 as being equivalent to adding a quarter to greenhouse gas forcing. Now, um, we've done some analysis since then, and uh, one of my students has written a thesis on this, that in fact it's more like a half because they didn't take account of the fact that uh, snow lion is also retreating in the Arctic. The, the brown here are areas which normally are snow covered in winter uh, or th were thought to be or used to be. That's Alaska and Siberia, places you think of as cold. But now in the midsummer they are ice free or snow free and that again reduces the albedo. So if you add that uh, which is, in fact, an anomaly relative to the 1970s of about 6 million square kilometers. Uh, and add those in together, we're now getting an impact on global albedo, which is equivalent to adding a half to the amount of warming due to uh, the greenhouse gas emission alone. So if, if you start up your SUV and uh, emit two molecules of CO2 from the tailpipe, then this feedback process is giving you an extra molecule to add to global warming. Uh, the second effect is the uh, change in the rate of sea level rise. Um, we know that because uh, with the Arctic being largely ice free in summer, you have warmer air moving over the Arctic Ocean and moving over the, con the, the land mass of Greenland on the right hand side. And um, when that happens, um, it used to be the case that the surface of Greenland never melted, uh, but now in summer it's largely the, the, the surface of Greenland, uh, which is at over two kilometers above sea level, actually melts and you start to get uh, meltwater over the surface. It doesn't refreeze in, in winter, it runs off and a lot of the runoff is internal through holes in the ice sheet called uh, Moulin and it, somehow it gets into the ocean and the Greenland is losing mass at about 300 
cubic kilometers a year, which makes it the largest single source of, of sea level rise in the world, with Antarctica also coming along behind. Um, we already knew that what, what gave the, the, the sea level rise rates that were used by the IPCC in its early assessments was that it was assumed that about half the warming came from warming of the ocean uh, and change in density. The other half came from the melting of uh, mountain glaciers, uh, the Rockies, the Alps, and so on. And we know, of course, mountain glaciers everywhere in the world are retreating. This is the 100 years of retreat in a, a, a glacier in Svalbard. But the loss of ice from that is now far outstripped by the loss of ice from Greenland. And luckily, we now can measure the loss of ice from Greenland very accurately using the GRACE satellite, which is a, a, a gravity satellite mission. And here's some results showing the acceleration of the loss from Greenland. And it's, it's, it's going, it's increasing all the time. And Antarctica has now started to be losing mass as well. Uh, so that has led to some pretty dire changes in the IPCC predictions of uh, what sea level will be like um, in the year 2100. And these are very important because these predictions are given out to policymakers who have to plan seawall defenses and uh, uh, how are we going to protect cities on the basis of these figures. And they were pretty low right up until and including the 2007 assessment, but now the more measurements are being done on Greenland and Antarctica and the process is going on, the higher the estimates get, and already they're beyond one meter, and uh, some glaciologists are going much higher than that as they, as they discover further processes that are occurring. Uh, so we have, this is something very, very serious, because this is the, the advice we give to policymakers on how, how do you build a, a wall to defend London or defend Venice, uh, how fast is the sea level going to rise. Um, and also this is not a very good diagram, but it just shows an effect that's been mentioned before, which is that if you change a mean of a, of a normal distribution, you affect the extreme end disproportionately. So if the if the bell curve here is, is distribution of sea seawater height at, in some position, like the middle of the North Sea before the 1953 storm surge, then um, we, uh, uh, you, you, and, and the, the small, the far end of the distribution is the, is the probability of a, of a catastrophe, a flood, then if you, if you increase the mean, you increase the, the probability of a catastrophe by a large factor. And this is especially important if you can't raise the, the mean height of your flood defenses, for instance, in Bangladesh, where nobody can afford to raise the heights of flood defenses, so people have to endure the, the heights of storm surges in the Bay of Bengal, which will be getting higher as sea level rises. Um, the next effect is methane. Uh, as you can see, the Arctic Ocean actually is at least one third shallow shelf of 100 meters or less in depth. And that shelf area happens to be the very area that's become ice free in summer. You still have ice sitting in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, but not around the edges. And so in the summer, the shallow water around the edges absorbs solar radiation and warms up. And here we've got some uh, measurements which show five degrees of warming north of Siberia. Now, I was out there two years ago, and we got 11 degrees, which is very warm. Uh, it's the sort of temperature you have in the North Sea. Um, also, uh, moorings in, in the East Siberian Sea also show temperatures above zero. So what that means is that the, what we used to have in, in the shallow sh shelf seas, which was a protective layer uh, of permafrost on the seabed, which was acting like the lid of a pressure cooker, protecting, the, 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 protecting us from what lay beneath, which was methane hydrates. And here's some methane hydrates 
uh, dredged up. They look like ice, and in fact they are mostly ice. It's, it's ice containing methane molecules, and except that it burns if you put, apply a flame to it. And when you, you take away the protective layer of permafrost from the seabed, then it releases all this methane, and you see already every time people go there in the summer, there were more and more plumes of methane coming up from the seabed, and they all get to the surface. Uh, methane dissolves in water, but only if the water depth is several hundred meters. If it's 50 meters, the, the methane all comes out uh, of the sur sea surface, gets into the atmosphere, and becomes a very potent greenhouse gas. And here's some photos taken from an underwater vehicle of methane plumes and methane bubbles lying up against some sea ice. Uh, now, that, that is that having an already an impact on uh, temperatures in the world? And, and uh, the evidence was that methane levels had, uh, had reached uh, a, a flat level in the, begin the first decade of this century. Um, but uh, we find that, in fact, that's, hmm, that, that, in, that, that they've actually been going up. Uh, in the last few years, and uh, the fear is that there's there's much more methane waiting to be released from from the Arctic seabed, and uh, we did a, an analysis of what would happen if uh, if 50 gigatons were released, which is about 8% of the of the methane contained in the sediments of the East Siberian Sea alone, and we concluded that the uh, that it would give you an immediate warming of about 0.6 of a degree. So if you, if you have a different view about how much methane is, is liable to come out, then you'll get to a different number, but it's still a big number for a very rapid warming effect. Um, so the next problem, this is, this is potentially, I think, the greatest short-term immediate threat facing uh, the planet and uh, should be taken much more seriously because the probability that it's going to happen is significant and the effect will be big. So a, a risk analysis would say we should be looking at offshore methane. Um, then two, two other effects. <laughs> One is well, a minute for each. One is that the, Antarctic, the Atlantic thermal haline circulation is diminishing in strength. This is the, the circulation uh, which is, it has a surface and a deep part uh, not associated with wind being wind driven, but driven by temperature and, and salinity variations. And um, in the Atlantic, the, the circulation, one of the drivers is the fact that water is sinking or was sinking in a very small area of the Greenland Sea where there's an ice tongue called the Odden. And this produced um, very rapid ice growth. Uh, and therefore brine rejection, which led to sinking of the water, surface water, giving you these very narrow, deep chimneys, uh, which were rotating cylinders by which water sank to the seabed. And here's, we did a lot of surveys of these in winter, and here's a chimney uh, <laughs> drawn with a chimney color, so, so it looks like a chimney. Uh, but the trouble is, these chimneys no longer form because Sea, sea ice no longer forms in that part of the Greenland Sea. So that implies uh, a diminution of the strength of the Atlantic thermal hairline circulation. This is shown by reduction in the speeds of deep currents in the Atlantic. And the predictions of, of models, this is a, a model of the European Environment Agency, are that that will lead to uh, less warming of Western Europe, especially uh, Britain and Iceland, uh, because it's receiving less warm water from the Gulf of Mexico, and because the, the, the circulation goes in the same direction as the Gulf Stream at the surface. But it means more warm water in the Gulf of Mexico, and that's uh, more rapid warming of surface waters there, which would lead to an intensification of hurricanes, and that's already being observed. So there's a, and the final thing in the last half minute is something that concerns us a lot at the moment and is perhaps the most complex feedback of all because it goes through several stages. What's happening is that, that uh, the Arctic is warming relatively rapidly. That's, that's, that's uh, reducing the temperature difference between Arctic air and tropical air. 
that's reducing the strength of the jet stream, which is tending to break up into lobes, and that is what's leading to unnatural amounts of hot air or cold air at mid-latitudes, and that then results in crop losses, and that can result in warfare. So we have an Arctic sea ice loss leading via fe several feedbacks to warfare. And uh, this, uh, this has been happening for last, about the last decade in North America, but it was, became visible in Europe this early this year when we had a very extreme cold weather uh, during the January and February, but the Arctic was having extremely warm weather. They were having temperatures more than 20 degrees higher than average. So we had this, uh, we had this um, alternation of unnaturally warm and unnaturally cold weather. Now, the thing about that is oops, um, uh, the, the fluctuations involved in that lead uh, are most powerful in mid-latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere because uh, you're, you're bringing down cold air to where it shouldn't be, you're bringing up warm air to where it shouldn't be because of these lobes that are forming in the, in the jet stream. And the mid-latitudes <coughs> the Northern Hemisphere is where we grow most of our food. Uh, so that's, this is the intensity of crop production is greatest in Central North America and Europe and Ukraine. Um, and because of that, there's been a big increase in the price of food. The uh, FAO produced a food price index in 2000, set at 100, and it rose in 2008 and 2011 to more than 200. Uh, these were years, ha coincidentally perhaps, that were years of extreme ice retreat in the Arctic. And the, the, all the, the writing on this is places where there was social unrest, revolution, etc. Uh, the Arab Spring, for instance. And this corresponded to places where people were living in cities in the third world without any co possibility of growing food, having to buy food, and finding that food's expensive and then having uh, rebelling if, if they couldn't afford to buy it. So we're having social unrest in in the Middle East and other parts of the world associated with the price of food, which is associated with crop failure, which is associated with these uh, fluctuations in, in the jet stream. And we know from war that, that warming itself will give us crop losses, um, which is why two degrees was chosen as as the, the, the figure we shouldn't go beyond. But these crop losses due to weather impacts, I think, are uh, equally important and possibly more important. And especially when we look at projections of population this century, that uh, Africa is predicted to have a very high increase in population. And the problem, the problem of feeding uh, a, a continent in a pl in when we're having, in addition to the normal problems, we're having uh, crop loss problems, makes it really something uh, very, very serious. Dr. Peter, could you wrap up now? Yeah, so I'll just wrap up <laughs> uh, by saying that, in my view, um, although I, I would like us to be able to, to meet the, the, the carbon emission reductions that, that everybody's trying to achieve, I think these sort of feedbacks make things worse, and there are many ways in which we're making things worse for ourselves. Uh, and I think we, we should be putting a lot of attention into uh, artificial means of taking, getting rid of carbon dioxide, like direct air capture. It's, it's something that's been mentioned in the IPCC 1.5, but it's something where I fear that, that we're going to be so, so in, inefficient at reducing our emissions fast enough that we must go for this much more seriously. So we should think about both geoengineering methods like this uh, cloud brightening technique, but also mostly direct air capture and, and treat that very seriously. Oh, thank you. <laughs>